Philippians 3.20 Our conversation is in heaven. The interior life presupposes the state of grace, which is the seed of eternal life. Nevertheless, the state of grace, which exists in every infant after baptism and in every penitent after the absolution of his sins, does not suffice to constitute what is customarily called the interior life of a Christian. In addition, there are required a struggle against what would make us fall back into sin and a serious tendency of the soul toward God. From this point of view, to give a clear idea of what the interior life should be, we shall do well to compare it with the intimate conversation that each of us has with himself. If one is faithful, this intimate conversation tends, under the influence of grace, to become elevated, to be transformed, and to become a conversation with God. This remark is elementary. But the most vital and profound truths are elementary truths about which we have thought for a long time, by which we have lived, and which finally become the object of almost continual contemplation. We shall consider successively these two forms of intimate conversation, the one human, the other more and more divine or supernatural. As soon as a man ceases to be outwardly occupied to talk with his fellow men, as soon as he is alone, even in the noisy streets of a great city, he begins to carry on a conversation with himself. If he is young, he often thinks of his future. If he is old, he thinks of the past and his, un his happy or unhappy experience of life makes him usually judge persons and events very differently. If a man is fundamentally egotistical, his intimate conversation with himself is inspired by sensuality or pride. He converses with himself about the object of his cupidity, of his envy. Finding therein sadness and death, he tries to flee from himself to live outside of himself, to divert himself in order to forget the emptiness and the nothingness of his life. In this intimate conversation of the egoist with himself, there is a certain very inferior self-knowledge and a no less inferior self-love. He is acquainted especially with the sensitive part of his soul, that part which is common to man and to the animal. Thus he has sensible joys, sensible sorrows, according as the weather is pleasant or unpleasant, as he wins money or loses it. He has desires and aversions of the same sensible order, and when he is opposed he has moments of impatience and anger prompted by inordinate self-love. But the egoist knows little about the spiritual part of his soul, that which is common to the angel and to man. Even if he believes in the spirituality of the soul and of the higher faculties, intellect and will, he does not live in this spiritual order. He does not, so to speak, know experimentally this higher part of himself, and he does not love it sufficiently. If he knew it, he would find in it the image of God, and he would begin to love himself not in an egotistical manner for himself, but for God. His thoughts almost always fall back on what is inferior in him, and though he often shows intelligence and cleverness, which may even become craftiness and cunning, his intellect, instead of rising, always inclines toward what is inferior to him. It is made to contemplate God, the supreme truth, and it often dallies in error, sometimes obstinately defending the error by every means. 
It has been said that if life is not on a level with thought, thought ends by descending to the level of life. All declines and one's highest convictions gradually grow weaker. The intimate conversation of the egoist with himself proceeds thus to death and is therefore not an interior life. His self-love leads him to wish to make himself the centre of everything, to draw everything to himself, both persons and things. Since this is impossible, he frequently ends in disillusionment and disgust. He becomes unbearable to himself and to others and ends by hating himself because he wished to love himself excessively. At times he ends by hating life because he desired too greatly what is inferior in it. If a man who is not in the state of grace begins to seek goodness, his intimate conversation with himself is already quite different. He converses with himself, for example, about what is necessary to live becomingly and to support his family. This at times preoccupies him greatly. He feels his weakness and the need of placing his confidence no longer in himself alone, but in God. While still in the state of mortal sin, this man may have Christian faith and hope, which subsist in us even after the loss of charity, as long as we have not sinned mortally by incredulity, despair or presumption. When this is so, this man's intimate conversation with himself is occasionally illumined by the supernatural light of faith. Now and then he thinks of eternal life and desires it, although this desire remains weak. He is sometimes led by a special inspiration to enter a church to pray. Finally, if this man has at least attrition for his sins and receives absolution for them, he recovers a state of grace and charity the love of God and neighbour. Thenceforth, when he is alone, his intimate conversation with himself changes. He begins to love himself in a holy manner, not for himself, but for God, and to love his own for God. He begins to understand that he must pardon his enemies and love them, and to wish eternal life for them as he does for himself. Often, however, the intimate conversation of a man in the state of grace continues to be tainted with egoism, self-love, sensuality and pride. These sins are no longer mortal in him, they are venial, but if they are repeated, they incline him to fall into a serious sin, that is to fall back into spiritual death. Should this happen, this man tends again to flee from himself because what he finds in himself is no longer life, but death. Instead of making a salutary reflection on this subject, he may hurl himself back farther into death by casting himself into pleasure, into the satisfactions of sensuality or of pride. In a man's hours of solitude, this intimate conversation begins again in spite of everything, as if to prove to him that it cannot stop. He would like to interrupt it, yet he cannot do so. The centre of the soul has an irrestrainable need which demands satisfaction. In reality, God alone can answer this need, and the only solution is straightway to take the road leading to him. The soul must converse with someone other than itself. Why? Because it is not its own last end, because its end is the living God, and it cannot rest entirely except in him. As St. Augustine puts it, our heart is restless until it repose in thee. That's from Book 1, Chapter 1 of the Confession. Our heart is restless until it repose in thee. This is the proof for the existence of God through natural desire for true and lasting happiness, which can be found only in the sovereign good, 
known at least imperfectly and loved above all and more than ourselves. We develop this proof in La Providence et la Confiance en Dieu, pages 50 to 64. The interior life is precisely an elevation and a transformation of the intimate conversation that everyone has with himself as soon as it tends to become a conversation with God. St. Paul says, For what man knoweth the things of a man but the spirit of a man that is in him? So the things also that are of God no man knoweth but the spirit of God. The Spirit of God progressively manifests to souls of goodwill what God desires of them and what he wishes to give them. May we receive with docility all that God wishes to give us. Our Lord says to those who seek him, Thou wouldst not seek me if thou hadst not already found me. This progressive manifestation of God to the soul that seeks him is not unaccompanied by a struggle. The soul must free itself from the bonds which are the results of sin, and gradually there disappears what St Paul calls the old man, and there takes shape the new man. He writes to the Romans, I find then a law that when I have a will to do good, evil is present with me. For I am delighted with the law of God according to the inward man, but I see another law in my members, fighting against the law of my mind. What St Paul calls the inward man is what is primary and most elevated in us, reason illumined by faith and the will, which should dominate the sensibility common to man and animals. St Paul also says, For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man is corrupted, Yet the inward man is renewed day by day. His spiritual youth is continually renewed like that of the eagle by the graces which he receives daily. This is so true that the priest who ascends the altar can always say, though he be ninety years old, I will go into the altar of God, to God who giveth joy to my youth. St Paul insists on this thought in his epistle to the Colossians. Lie not one to another, stripping yourselves of the old man with his deeds and putting on the new, him who is renewed unto knowledge according to the image of him that created him, where there is neither Gentile nor Jew, nor barbarian nor Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. The inward man is renewed unceasingly in the image of God who does not grow old. The life of God is above the past, the present and the future. It is measured by the single instant of immobile eternity. Likewise, the risen Christ dies no more and possesses eternal youth. Now he vivifies us by ever new graces that he may render us like himself. St Paul wrote in a similar strain to the Ephesians, For this cause I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened by his Spirit, with might into the inward man, that Christ may dwell by faith in your hearts, that being rooted and founded in charity, you may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, to know also the charity of Christ which surpasseth all knowledge, that you may be filled unto all the fullness of God. St Paul clearly depicts in these lines the interior life in its depth, that life which tends constantly toward the contemplation of the mystery of God, and lives by it in an increasingly closer union with him. He wrote this letter not for some privileged souls alone, but to all the Christians of Ephesus as well as those of Corinth. Furthermore, St Paul adds, be renewed in the spirit of your mind 
and put on the new man, who according to God is created in justice and holiness and truth of truth, and walk in love as Christ also has loved us, and hath delivered himself for us, an oblation and a sacrifice to God for an odour of sweetness. In the light of these inspired words, which recall all that Jesus promised us in the Beatitudes, and all that he gave us in dying for us, we can define the interior life as follows. It is a supernatural life which, by a true spirit of abnegation and prayer, makes us tend to union with God and leads us to it. It implies one phase in which purification dominates, another of progressive illumination in view of union with God, as all tradition teaches, thus making a distinction between the purgative way of beginners, the illuminative way of proficients, and the unitive way of the perfect. The interior life thus becomes more and more a conversation with God, in which man gradually frees himself from egoism, self-love, sensuality and pride, and in which by frequent prayer he asks the Lord for the ever new graces that he needs. As a result, man begins to know experimentally no longer only the inferior part of his being, but also the highest part. Above all, he begins to know God in a vital manner. He begins to have experience of the things of God. Little by little, the thought of his own ego, toward which he made everything converge, gives place to the habitual thought of God and egotistical love of self and of what is less good in him also gives place progressively to the love of God and of souls in God. His interior conversation changes so much that St Paul can say, our conversation is in heaven. St Thomas often insisted on this point. Therefore the interior life is in a soul that is in a state of grace, especially a life of humility, abnegation, faith, hope and charity. With the peace given by the progressive subordination of our feelings and wishes to the love of God, who will be the object of our beatitude. Hence to have an interior life, an exceedingly active exterior apostolate does not suffice nor does great theological knowledge, nor is the latter necessary. A generous beginner who already has a genuine spirit of abnegation and prayer already possesses a true interior life which ought to continue developing. In this interior conversation with God, which tends to become continual, the soul speaks by prayer, oratio, which is speech in its most excellent form. Such speech would exist if God had created only a single soul or one angel. For this creature, endowed with intellect and love, would speak with its creator. Prayer takes the form now of petition, now of adoration and thanksgiving. It is always an elevation of the soul toward God. And God answers by recalling to our minds what has been said to us in the Gospel and what is useful for the sanctification of the present moment. Did not Christ say, But the Paraclete, the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring all things to your mind whatsoever I shall have said to you. Man thus becomes more and more the child of God. He recognises more profoundly that God is his Father, and he even becomes more and more a little child in his relations with God. He understands what Christ meant when he told Nicodemus that a man must return to the bosom of God, that he may be spiritually reborn, and each day more intimately so, by that spiritual birth which is a remote similitude to the eternal birth of the Word. 
the saints truly follow this way. And then between their souls and God is established that conversation which does not, so to speak, cease. Thus it was said that Saint Dominic knew how to speak only of God or with God. This is what made it possible for him to be always charitable toward men and at the same time prudent, strong and just. This conversation with God is established through the influence of Christ our Mediator, as the liturgy often says, particularly in the hymn Jesu Ducis Memoria, which is a splendid expression of the Christian interior life. Jesu spes Penitentibus, quam pius est petentibus, quam bonus te quirentibus, sed quid indenientibus, nec lingua valet dicere, nec litera exprimere, expertus potest credere, quid sit Jesum dirigere. Let us strive to be of the number of those who seek him, and to whom it is said, Thou wouldst not seek me, if thou hast not already found me. <laughs>